This week we're in the money. Well, our listeners are anyway. We've had four different investors contact us with four different sums of money and they all want to know how to spend it. It's our dream episode and I'm sure you'll enjoy it too. Welcome to the Property Podcast, where every Thursday morning, property investors come to be informed and inspired. There aren't many things that we love more than hearing from our listeners. But one thing we do love even more than that is spending their money for them. So however much you're starting out with, there should be something in this episode that you can take away and put to good use. And stick around to the end for Hub Extra, where we've got a whole collection of resources that'll help you stay sane while you're locked down. So this week, we do not have a new story for you. We have two, you lucky so-and-sos. The first up is a reminder, a reminder to all property investors about the changes to capital gains tax. They are now in effect. What am I talking about? Rob, can you explain? I can. If you've not heard about this before, don't worry. This isn't a new horrendous thing. It's something announced a while ago that just came in for the new tax year at the start of April. So if you sell a property and you've got capital gains tax to pay, or if you've got capital gains tax to pay for any other reason, you've now only got 30 days to declare it and get it in. The government wants to get their cash in fast. Also, if you sell a property that you used to live in and have subsequently been renting out, the reliefs around that have been made less generous. Does it ever go the other way? So that's capital gains tax. But a couple of other things have come in at the start of April while we've all been distracted as well. One of them is the rules around minimum energy standards. You now can't rent out a property at all, even on an existing tenancy. If the EPC rating is an F or lower, that shouldn't be news. You've had since 2015 to sort that one out. And mortgage interest. The big transition to mortgage relief now not being claimable has finally happened. It's been phased in over the last four years. We can now say a tearful farewell to the old system because we're fully on the new one. So a few things there that we should already have known about, but worth flagging up that they're now in effect. And for our next news story, Rob, you've had an interesting email in. Now, we've previously talked about this on the podcast and the subject is mortgage holidays. The rumour that it could potentially affect your ability to get lending if you take a mortgage holiday. Well, as we said at the time, it was a rumour But Rob, there seems to be some evidence around this now based on an email you got in. Yeah, so this is just with one lender. So if you've got a mortgage going through right now, not something to panic about. Your broker should be able to tell you if any of this is relevant to you. But somebody kindly sent me what's called a COVID-19 declaration that was sent to him by a lender who he's taking out a new loan with. And there's a few clauses in there that really caught my eye. So one of the things is, I do not intend to make any requests for a mortgage payment holiday to assist with meeting our financial obligations. In other words, I'm not planning to take this mortgage out and then immediately ask for a holiday. Fair enough. Next one, I confirm that no application or request for a mortgage holiday has been made by me in respect of any mortgage that I am party to. So if you had already taken out a mortgage holiday, then you would not be able to sign this declaration. And there's a final one as well that I thought was really interesting that says that if we do make any approach to you for financial assistance, you will have the ability to contact any tenant occupying the property for confirmation of their ability to meet any rents due. So basically saying, if we think you're trying it on, we can check with the tenant. So again, this is only one lender, but I found that fascinating, Rob, because it reinforces what we were saying on the podcast the other day about not taking mortgage holidays because it looks like a free and easy way to ease your cash flow if you don't need to yet. Yeah, if you've got tenants, then obviously do not try it on and don't do it. If you've got a portfolio and you've only got one or two properties that are in that position, then again... You probably don't want to do that because you're going to be cash flowing elsewhere and still be positive, and you really should be positive if it's only one or two properties when it comes to your cash flow. And remember, this isn't a free giveaway. You will be paying it back and actually a little bit more than normal at the end because the interest is being rolled up for later down the line. So you're just kicking a can down the road. Now, of course, it is a great tool and instrument if you are in a cash flow pickle and you do need that assistance and aid. But if you're not... Don't just take it because it's there. As you can see from this email, it has the potential to affect you negatively elsewhere. Now, whether that's fair or not, that's not the debate here, but that's the facts. That's what this is. So do not take a mortgage holiday lightly. Use it if you need it, but if you don't need it, then our advice is don't use it. Now, we are banging out the property content for you at the moment. We've got loads coming out, you know, two podcasts. That wasn't enough in this environment. We've got, you know, three podcasts a week now. And of course, that's on top of all the other things that we have, the courses, the magazine, loads. 
But as you may be aware, we also have the YouTube channel, which is growing in popularity. It's super cool to see so many people subscribing and taking advantage of the content there. And we have a brand new course published in the last 24 hours, hot off the press, and we're covering property expenses. And should you be paying them? Yep, check out that video because we're running through some common expenses and whether they're worth incurring. So we might be able to save you some money. And while you're there, as a reminder, you can listen to the podcast on YouTube as well. We're uploading all our episodes there. So if you prefer to listen to the podcast that way, you can do. Just make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. We love it when listeners get in touch asking about their strategy. Firstly, because it's always fun spending other people's money for them, but also because talking about strategy is one of the highest leverage things you can do because it affects everything that comes afterwards. All the things that you do tactically and however well you run your business will only be as effective as your strategy. So this week, we're going to hear from four listeners who've called in. They actually sent in these questions to Ask Rob and Rob. You can do the same with any of your questions by going to propertyhub.net slash ask. And we've collected them together because they all represent people at the start of their journey all starting with very different levels of resources behind them. They want to know how they should be investing for their circumstances, especially in the current climate. So we're going to do our best to answer. So first up, let's hear from James and hear about his situation and his plans. Hi, Rob and Rob. James here. First, I just want to say how helpful your podcasts have been for me educating myself. I've just bought both of Rob D's books and they're so easy to read and understand. So I'm really enjoying that. I've not invested yet, but that's what I kind of want to ask you about. I'm 20 years old, I've been saving for a deposit on a house under a LISA, aided by the government's 25% bonus. I want to move out my parents' house for the next couple of years, and I've got about 10 grand at the moment. I'm currently able to save about 500 quid a month, and I just want to get your opinions on two approaches in buying my first investment. First one, they living at home, withdraw the money from my LISA and take the penalty fee on the chin, then just carry on saving as normal and use this cash to buy a second property to begin my journey. The second one is after two years, I think I'll potentially have 24 grand, including the bonus. If you want to buy a new house under the license, it's got to be residential. So I'll buy a house or flat, I'm thinking around 100, 150 grand, depending on what's available. And then potentially use the government's rental room scheme to aid saving for an investment. My thought process being that this house would eventually be able to be let out repaired after a period of time has passed per the rules of the rent of the uh, license, sorry and could potentially have a decent cash pot, take advantage of the crash all the way down the line, um, and maybe pick up a few properties then. Just wanted to get your thoughts and suggestions for someone who's looking for to get started and still lives with parents. Hi, James. Thanks for your question. And well done putting that savings pot together. I certainly didn't have that amount at 20 years old. So you're in a great position. If you carry on this discipline and are putting plans in place for property investment now, I'm really optimistic about your future. And it sounds like you're pretty switched on because based on what you're saying, you're using the first time buyer's ISA, which basically gives you £3,000 extra from the government towards your first home. And that is attractive. And I can see why that's swaying your decision on whether you should start investing or whether you should buy your own home. Now, there's a couple of practical implications here. The first you've addressed, which is that you will lose that bonus if you take the money out of the ISA and put it towards a buy to let. The other thing you need to be aware of around buy to let is that it's going to be challenging for you to get a mortgage if you are a first time buyer and a first time landlord. It's not to say it's impossible, but it is a challenge. So one of the things you need to be doing up front is speaking to a mortgage broker to understand your options. Now there are lenders out there, that's the great news, but they'll need to dig into your personal circumstances a little bit more. For example, understanding what you earn every year to make sure that you can satisfy the requirements for those lenders. So let's assume that you've done that and you can invest. What should you do? Should you buy your own home or should you invest? If this comes down to the numbers, then the answer is invest in your first buy to let. And the reason I say that is although you'll give up a potential bonus of £3,000, if you invest wisely, then you can get that money back in less than a year, maybe even sooner from your first investment property. And then it will be producing an income, which will then speed up your savings pot towards your own home. And of course, by buying an investment property, if you can combine the return with an area that's prime for capital growth, then again, you could be on to a winner. Because when you're buying an investment property, you can buy anywhere in the country. You're not restricted to living locally to your workplace or where you want to live. Your own home, could it be a good investment and go up in value? Yes. 
But are there going to be better places in the country that will give better capital growth potential and or a better return? Absolutely. So based on the numbers, the right thing to do here is invest. Now, you're not a robot and there will be something called emotions that will come into this decision as well. Are you prepared to carry on living with your parents? If you are, great. Go with the option I've described. But I also understand that this is going to be more than just basing your decision on numbers. Are you able and willing to live at home for a number of more years to then rebuild your pot towards your own property? So for me, James, this is a bit of a no-brainer. But then again, James, that's that's only one of us. Rob, you may feel completely different. Terrible advice, that is. No, I completely agree. I think you're right, Rob, to highlight the practical factor here. Because James, as Rob's already said, you're doing brilliantly by thinking about all this at this stage, which most of your friends won't be doing. But you don't want to go too far the other way and do everything purely about the numbers and purely thinking about the future and not live the life you want to live now. There is a balance to be struck. But from the fact that you're even thinking about this at such a young age and the fact that you're talking about using the rent a room schemes, you're clearly willing to make compromises there in exchange for more income. I'm very confident that whatever you decide to do, if you check back in with us in 10 years time, you'll have made incredible progress. So please do. Okay, let's move on now to hear from Jay and see what situation he's in. Hi, Rob and Rob. This is Jay speaking. I really wanted your advice on buy to let in Manchester. I'm really looking at Salford Crescent and I'm quite excited about high rise living uh, in Manchester. These can be safe investments. And I'm just wondering what I should do in the future. I've got an inheritance. My father's no longer here. How can I really make that work for me. Okay, Jay, thank you for getting in touch. You didn't say in your question whether you're living in Manchester or whether that's just an investment area that's got your attention. But either way, it's led you to a good place. As we've talked about multiple times on the podcast before, lots of exciting things going on in Manchester at the moment. And among those, all the shiny new developments going up in the city centre. And it is really exciting. And I can see why you want to be a part of that. And among those developments, there will be some bad ones that you won't want to get involved with. But there are some really, really good ones as well. However, let let me bring you from those high rises back down to earth. While it's great to be excited about property, remember this is an investment. One of the things that makes property such a good investment is you can get so excited by it. And that means that you do more research than you would on an investment that you find really boring and you make more sacrifices in order to be able to invest in it. So I'm not saying that the emotional connection in property is a bad thing because it's really not. But when you start out, you need to be careful and not jump ahead and start thinking about particular investments, especially exciting ones, too early. In fact, I would encourage you not to think about particular investments or even particular areas too much at all until you've got clear on something much more basic, what you actually want. Again, as we've said on the podcast, you could use property in lots of different ways to achieve all manner of different goals. It's a very flexible investment. But what actually do you want? How much money do you want coming in? What do you want your life to be like? What do you enjoy? What do you not enjoy? When do you want to have this done by? Those are all critical questions to answer before you take it any further. And it's particularly important to slow it down and strip out the emotion when you've had an inheritance. I'm not saying it's always the case, but it's often the case that when someone has suddenly got an amount of money far greater than they've ever had before, and there's understandably lots of emotion tied up in that money, it can be easy to rush into decisions that feel right at the time, but do not best serve your long-term goals. So Jay, if I had one bit of advice for you, it would be don't look at any investments yet. I'm not saying don't be excited about property, but I'm saying channel your excitement into what property can do for you in the long term and what it can help you achieve. Then once you're clear on that, you can reward yourself by diving back in and getting excited about particular investments once again. So good luck, James. Our next caller has a nice sum of money, but wants a very, very attractive return. Hi, Rob and Rob. I've got a pot of 200k and I'm looking for a potential return of around 40% on my investment per year, but on income basis. I know this is very ambitious, but I want to go down the buy, refurb and refinance strategy and try and pull money out after the refurbs. I know this is pretty high, but is this at all possible if I put the work in? Thank you. You're right. This is very ambitious and also a bit unrealistic. Now, this is a really interesting question. And having that amount of money to invest is great. And of course, there are people who will tell you that, you know, you can achieve big returns. And yes, your number is ambitious. Is it possible to buy a property 
refurb it, refinance, and see that the money in versus the new value is for that you've made a 40% return? Yes. Is it easy? No. But it can be done. What you have to do is make sure that you buy right and refurb right. Because while it sounds very simple, it's actually a lot harder to do. And this is where a lot of your time will go in. Researching properties that are undervalued even pre-refurb is really difficult. And that's actually where most people struggle with this strategy. There are lots of people out there who are great at refurbing properties. But finding these types of properties, it is difficult. It is difficult to achieve. So that's where you're going to be putting your time in. And that's where you're going to have to put your effort in through networking with other investors and estate agents and even letting agents because they may have landlords who are after a quick sale, possibly doing some marketing yourself. There is a lot that can be done, but it is a lot. You need to do it. These type of deals won't fall on your lap. There are lots of properties out there that need refurbing, but the price level isn't right because once you then factor in the cost of the refurb, the numbers just don't stack. Never mind a 40% return. In some cases, no return. In many cases, no return. Then the refurb. If you've not done this before, you need to get this right. You can overspend and you can underspend and both will hurt you. You need to get it just right. So again, networking with people who've done this, hopefully in the area that you're looking to operate in, will help. And taking some advice and guidance from them will set you up for success. The bit that confuses me with the question, and maybe I've not understood it properly, is the how you get the income up because you can get that return on the property and then you can recycle some of the cash through a refinance. But then the paying yourself part is where it becomes difficult because if you want to do this year on year, you need to keep redeploying your cash. Rob, can you help me out? Not particularly because I'm not clear on that point either. There might be an angle that we're not thinking about, but there is a big difference between achieving that ROI in terms of growing your assets. Of course, if you are continuously using the same pot of money to build an ever bigger portfolio, then that can build up to a really great income over the time because you've got more and more rent coming in. But that doesn't put money in your pocket right now. I'd also say that, of course, you can get more ambitious over time because you're more likely to make mistakes in any of the areas that Rob mentioned on your first few projects and then improve over time as you get into the groove and learn all your lessons. So possible, yes, depending on whether you want the money now as cash to spend or not. But either way, be under no illusions. Deploying that amount of money in this type of project and keeping it going round and round is going to be pretty much a full time job. So make sure you're up for the journey. But Rob, I'm up for the next question because we've got £3 million to spend. Hi guys. I was just wondering, if you have £3 million in liquid cash to invest in the property market, whether that's in the UK or overseas, what strategy would you do and why? So it might be buy to let, might be development, might be um, build to let. And in terms of if it's buy to let, would you be looking to buy smaller, low cost properties or mid range or larger properties? I know it's a slightly random question, but in the current climate, it's a safe place to have money. So any help would be greatly appreciated. Keep up the great work. Right, now you're talking £3 million to invest. Let's go. So I can see two broad routes to this here. So of course, we know nothing about your goals here. We've already stressed the importance of that multiple times in this episode alone. So without knowing anything about you or what you're good at or what you want to ultimately achieve, we can't give a tailored answer. But let's just assume that you're going for some kind of pretty normal mix of having some money coming in and having some portfolio growth over time. Taking that as our assumption, I can see two broad paths here. One of those is just doing really normal buy to let, but at scale, because you've got a really good amount of money to invest. If you were doing that and you were investing in properties costing on average £200,000, which is a pretty normal mid-range type of buy to let price, that would get you 15 properties in round terms, ignoring taxes and all that kind of thing. If you use the maximum leverage that you possibly could with that money, that would actually get you to 60 properties. Now, that might sound fantastic and really exciting. But to me, that sounds like quite a lot of work, especially if you want to deploy this money quickly. Buying 60 properties and dealing with the admin on those, even if you're getting them fully managed, is a lot of work. But there's another path open to you as well, and that is going for higher value properties or going for blocks of properties. That makes it easier to deploy your cash more quickly, also means fewer transactions, and it concentrates the admin and the management. The great thing at looking at, say, 
blocks of flats at a million pounds plus is that market is small at the best of times. Not many people are playing in that kind of arena and that means that you can do better deals. That's particularly true at the moment when people are nervous about what the future holds for the property market and for the economy in general. So there are even fewer buyers around than usual. So that means if you're brave and if you're very careful, there could be some really nice deals to do at that kind of level. So if it were me, and I kind of wish it was, I'd be drawn towards that second route of going for a smaller number of bigger transactions. But Rob, I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, Rob, I think you've nailed this and looking at what's important. And building up a big portfolio of lots of individual properties is actually going to take a lot of time because you're going to go and find them all. And then a lot of management. I would go and buy a block or a ready-made portfolio. And as Rob, you've rightly highlighted, you're in a smaller field of competitors as well. Now, the good thing about going for a block is that you would expect a slightly higher return. So let's say for argument's sake, normal buy-to-lets give you about a 5% return. Now, we can all debate on what you should be getting and it will come down to the type of property and where it is. But let's just use that as a benchmark. I would expect then another 2 to 3% uplift by going in for a block because you're buying in bulk. So I would expect to see possibly a 7 maybe even an 8% return. That's what I'd be looking for here. You can push further, and of course you can find blocks that will give you double-digit returns. Then you've got to be careful about what you're buying. And that's really the final point on this for me, is while you can do better by buying in bulk, you can also do a lot worse because you're either exaggerating your upside or exaggerating your downside. If you get this wrong, and there's a lot of rubbish on the market, if you get it wrong, then you've got it wrong for all your money. All of it is at risk. Whereas if you split it into individual properties, then if you get it wrong once or twice, it's not going to hurt you as much. But if you put it into one investment, even if it is multiple properties, and you've got it wrong, then it's going to hurt. So yes, it absolutely can give you more upside, but it can hurt you just as much on the downside as well. So do not rush in. Proceed with caution. It's a fantastic amount of money to invest with, but you can get it fantastically wrong as well. So there is a common theme and a common thread through all of our answers here, and it is research. Spending that time up front will make the difference between you being a successful investor, an average investor, or a poor investor. And I know which one I'd rather be. Now, this has been a packed episode, but we could always make time for Hub Extra, that bit of the show where we give you a tool, a resource, a thought, something to take away and make your life a little bit better. And your life is even better if you're a Property Hub member, because then you'll also get the Hub Extra email in your inbox every Friday morning. This week's resource is from Money Saving Expert, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with. I'm a big fan. And they've put together a really helpful list of digital resources that normally you have to pay for, but the companies behind them have made free while everyone is locked down and looking for something to do. There's all sorts in there, including meditation apps that we've talked about in the past. There's lots of different lessons for your kids. There's even guitar lessons and opera broadcasts. Absolutely loads and it's been really helpful to have it all in one place. So head to today's show notes. You'll find the link to Money Saving Expert there and enjoy. So that's us done for another week. We spent a lot of money this week. That was quite enjoyable. We'll be back tomorrow with our market updates recorded on the day. So it's raw and real. And we'll then be back with Ask Rob and Rob on Tuesday. So plenty to keep you busy with, along with those YouTube videos we mentioned earlier in the show. So consume, educate yourselves, and come back a bit more knowledgeable tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.